morning. Uh, Welcome, everybody. It's a great group of people out here today and appreciate your attendance. Um, the first item on the agenda is to approve the committee's agenda. This roll call. Oh, gosh, that's correct. I, I'll that's never get this right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the State Superintendent of Public Instruction, uh, Ms. Sanders. Present. Chairperson Prezant. Here. Ms. Yamamoto. Here. Mr. Tang. Here. Ms. Bradford. Here. Mr. Keeley. Here. Ms. Hendricks. Here. Mr. Gunning. Here. For the State Treasurer, Mr. Henning. Here. For the Director of Finance, Ms. Miller. Here. Chairperson, you have a quorum, and if it pleases the chair, I'll read a brief preliminary note. The CalSTRS board meetings are live web stream and video archived and available to the public on calsters.com. Individuals who wish to address the board should wait for the 10-minute public comment period at the end of the agenda item the speaker wishes to address. For comments not pertaining to a specific agenda item, there will be an opportunity for additional statements at the end of the open session. Each speaker is allowed a maximum of three minutes to comment. However, if there is not enough time for each speaker to have three minutes, the timing will be at the discretion of the chair. To protect the privacy of speakers under the age of 18 who wish to address the board, only their first name and affiliated organization may be provided. But other personal identifying information, such as their last name, age, or school, may not be shared. Since the January board meeting, CalSTIR received a letter from the Domestic Workers Justice Initiative and Migrant Forum in Asia about illegal recruitment fees charged by employment agencies to migrant domestic workers in Singapore and Hong Kong. That's all I have, Chairperson. Thank you. Uh, again, welcome. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the committee agenda uh, with uh, some flexibility. So uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, the, before we begin, uh, there's been a tradition uh, that was commenced earlier last year uh, by our chair, uh, Harry Kiley, which I think has been superb. And we have the opportunity today to have a lot of the uh, staff and some of our consultants and obviously uh, some uh, guests here in the room uh, and it's a it's a a video that uh, sort of introduces us all to one of our members uh, and so Harry from one of your board members uh, and I know from all of us this was a great idea because each one of these videos has demonstrated to uh, all of us why we're here and I thank you for it so if you could run the video, that would be great. My name is Laura Wilhelm. I'm an art teacher at University Preparatory School. I teach 6th through 12th grade art. I come from a really creative family. Uh, both my parents are very creative with um, their hands. They, uh, my dad's a mechanic and my mom it, works with jewelry. And I've always known I wanted to be a teacher. I didn't know what I wanted to teach and, until I went to college, started taking more art courses, and that's when I knew I wanted to be a teacher. I'm really proud of the relationships that I've built, uh, whether it be other teachers or the admin, my students, as well too. Um, I can have my students for up to seven years and beyond because I do keep that relationship after they go to college. Uh, several of my students have become art teachers and I'm very, very proud of them. I encourage anybody to be a teacher. It's the most fulfilling thing that I've ever, have ever done. So I'm not only an art teacher, I'm an artist too, and we're standing in front of one of my murals. I have other murals around the city as well. I also have art shows in the community as well. Every other month I teach a adult art class. And a lot of times when I'm working with my students, I treat it as a studio, and they are artists that I'm just working with. I love art, and that's why I teach it. I'm also a marathon swimmer. 
A marathon swimmer is somebody that swims 10K or more nonstop. I first started doing them about five years ago and it wasn't very hard at all. Coming to the finish. So I decided after that that I wanted to go a little bit longer. This summer I swam the English Channel and along with the Catalina Channel too. Those are both swims over 20 miles. Non-stop, can't touch boat, can't touch anything. <laughs> Having a retirement for myself uh, through CalSTRS is uh, pretty nice because I know I'm going to have a paycheck for the rest of my life. I'm able to see like when I'm able to finish and uh, have a plan for that. I've worked with many uh, teachers and principals um, since then they have retired and they seem to be happy and relaxed in doing what they want to do after retirement, which is awesome. If you want to do something, you got to do it now. So I'm going to keep swimming. I'm going to keep making art, murals. I'm probably going to keep teaching even if I retire. I love it so much. With those aerobic exercises, uh, I think she'll <laughs> live a long life. <laughs> anyway, uh, the next item on our agenda uh, is uh, the opportunity for statements from the public. And I believe we have, uh, I, I've got a list of at least four people, but uh, if, if there is anyone, would you help out? Uh, okay. First speaker. Our first speaker will be Cecilia, um, accompanied by a translator. Cecilia will get six minutes. Cecilia Alvarado, y he trabajado por el Hotel Holiday Inn LAX por 24 años como recamarera. Good morning. My name is Cecilia Alvarado, and I've worked for the Holiday Inn LAX for 24 years as a housekeeper. El Hotel Holiday Inn LAX es operado por el Ambridge, que a su vez es propiedad de Advent Interna International. The Holiday Inn LAX is operated by Ambridge, which is owned by Advent International. Esta es la tercera vez que he estado aquí hablando en frente de ustedes de Cultures desde que mis compañeros del trabajo y yo comenzamos a hacer una huelga para conseguir las necesidades básicas que merecemos para poder sobrevivir y mantener a nuestras familias. This is the third Calster meeting I've attended since my coworkers and I began going on strike to win the basic necessities we deserve to be able to survive and provide for our families. Ambridge ha utilizado a trabajadores migrantes refugiados para intentar romper la huelga en nuestro hotel y está siendo investigado por el fiscal del Distrito del Condado de Los Ángeles y el Comisionado Laboral de California. Ambridge has used migrant refugee workers to try to break the strike at our hotel and is being investigated by the Los Angeles County District Attorney and California Labor Commissioner. También la compañía Enbridge enfrenta un cargo federal de práctica laboral injusta que se alega que un manejador de mi hotel advirtió a los miembros, a los mismos trabajadores sin hogar, que no, de, que no digan a nadie sobre su salario u otras condiciones laborales, entre muchos otros cargos. They, Enbridge, also faces local 11, uh, that local 11 filed two federal unfair labor char practice charges alleging discriminatory disciplines of a shop steward and an unlawful request for immigrant immigration documents at the Double Tree downtown Los Angeles and a class action lawsuit filed, I think I skipped, sorry, apologize. They also face federal and labor, uh, labor practice charges alleging that a manager of my hotel warned the same unhoused workers not to tell anyone about their pay and other working conditions among many other charges. Las huelgas, historias en la prensa, acusaciones de acoso sexual y cargos legales son riesgos para sus inversiones. Strikes, headlines, alleged sexual harassment, and legal charges are all risks to your investments. Enbridge y Adven no escuchan a sus trabajadores. ¿Te están escuchando? 
Ambridge and Advent won't listen to their workers. Are they listening to you? No, he just Okay, um, that's fine. All right, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Beatrice. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Beatriz Sopete, and I'm the Arizona Organizing Director with Hospitality Workers Union Unite Here Local 11. As you know, CalSTRS currently faces ESG risk connected to its investment with Blackstone Group, which owns hotels currently facing labor dispute in Southern California and Arizona, and Advent International Portfolio Company, Ambridge Hospitality, which operates nine hotels facing labor disputes in Southern California. Women workers have brought forward allegations of sexual harassment and ineffective management in multiple Ambridge operated properties in Southern California. At the Ambridge Managed Hampton Inn in Santa Monica, one worker recently alleged in a letter to the California Civil Rights Department that a male coworker repeatedly verbally threatened her at work, including by aggressively calling her, excuse my language, in her letter, she alleges that the verbal threats and sexist slurs continue for over six weeks, even though she reported the behavior to the general manager on multiple locations. She alleges that the hotel failed to respond appropriately to her complaints of harassment and instead, the hotel retaliated against her by terminating her. Another woman worker at the same hotel has brought forward allegations concerning harassment by management. At the Sheraton Park in Anaheim, workers have also made allegations of sexual harassment. In fact, workers are preparing a protest that will happen this Friday on International Women's Day at the Sheraton Park demanding that Ambridge demonstrate respect for women workers. These alleged incidents and management conduct form what appears to be a pattern of managers at Ambridge properties failing to adequately ensure full respect for workers' rights or otherwise acting in ways that we, that we feel is appropriate. The situation demands urgent attention. Kelsters has acted previously to address sexual harassment at an investment property. Its intervention with CBRE at the Irvine Marriott several years ago was instrumental to the hotel addressing the issue. The issues, including adopting best practices like having panic buttons, ensuring workers can clean restrooms safely, and the like. There are broader issues with Ambridge. It is one of the only operators that has failed to resolve labor disputes at its hotels in Southern California and Arizona, which has been subject of strikes, picketing, protests since contracts expired last June. While companies like Hilton and Marriott and Hyatt, and this is only in Southern California, have successfully solved the labor dispute because in Phoenix they have not, Ambridge has failed to agree to the same standards in Southern California. The ESG risk raised by these issues are real, as real as the hotel workers that you have heard from in every board meeting since the strikes began. We ask that you engage publicly with these managers and withhold investments until they are resolved. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Matt. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Matthew Pena, and I worked as a cook at the Sheridan downtown Phoenix. Uh, I'm a proud member of Local 11 Unite Here. Um, I'm a proud transgender man, and trans affirming health care and birth control are very expensive. Uh, so expensive that I was forced to sell my plasma to pay my health care, but I can't do that anymore, though, because I'm diabetic. Uh, it is a constant struggle to afford my basic needs, keep a roof over my head, paying for health care, putting food on the table. Rent in Phoenix is skyrocketing. Uh, rent has gone up hundreds. My rent had gone up uh, hundreds over the last few years and I was forced to move back in with my parents. I can no longer afford the rent on, for my apartment on the hotel's wages, even with a roommate. Uh, it shouldn't be this difficult. That is why I'm fighting for living wages, affordable health insurance, and a pension so that one day I can hope to retire. Blackstone is the largest investment company in the world with one trillion, nearly $1 trillion. They can afford to pay us fairly. The question is, why are they choosing to not to do so? For the past several months, even when the temperature was almost 100 degrees in the mornings, uh, my coworkers and I have held picket lines outside of our hotel informing guests and the public about the labor disputes. Labor disputes are not good for business. 
Most recently, I believe that I have been unjustly discriminated against for my pro protected union activity as, using, as a union committee leader. Uh, we have filed an unfair labor practice charge against the Sheridan Phoenix with the National Labor uh, Relations Board alleging that I was unjustly suspended and fired. I'm only standing up for the wages, benefits, and the working conditions that I deserve. I don't deserve to be treated unfairly. That is why I can say that we are determined to see this fight through as long as it takes uh, to reach a just outcome for us workers. The longer the hotel drags out this fight, the more they are and their investors stand to lose in the coming months and from reduced earnings. Please tell Blackstone that they can make only make good on their investment by resolving labor disputes with a just contract. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Bill. Good morning. My name is Bill Jackson, and I'm a member and leader of the community organization called ACE, which stands for Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment. I have also been a Cal Sturs and Cal Purs member for many years. I'm here today to share our concerns about Blackstone, the largest equity fund and corporate landlord in the United States. Cal Sturs is a major investor in Blackstone, which is now the largest landlord in the U.S. with 300,000 units. Cal Sturs is also one of the largest investors in the Blackstone Fund, which is used to buy almost 6,000 housing units in the San Diego area. ACE released a report last year showing that Blackstone had raised rents in some of these units as much as 64% in just two years. You might have learned or heard in the news about the many lawsuits against a company called RealPage as well as a number of landlords and property managers. The lawsuits accused them of working together to illegally raise rents. This has directly contributed to California's affordable housing crisis. The company that Blackstone uses as a property manager at its San Diego properties is one of the companies named in these lawsuits. We ask that CalSTRS, as a major investor, ask Blackstone to report to you about its usage of RealPage at its California properties and what the rent increases were at these properties. In addition, I wanted to let you know that CalSTRS is also a major investor in the private equity funds that own RealPage. to report to, um, and those funds are named in the many uh, lawsuits which uh, put CalSTRS investment at risk. We ask that CalSTRS ask Thomas Bravo, the private equity firm that owns RealPage to report to CalSTRS about the number of properties in California that use RealPage and what the rent increases were at these properties. Investors should tell Blackstone not to invest their money in any deal unless Blackstone agrees to a set of standards that would ensure basic protections for tenants and protect investors from potentially damaging news headlines and reputational risks. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. That is the conclusion of public comment in person. We have no commenters calling in on the phone line right now. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, those of you who came today to uh, express your views on uh, certain uh, human capital issues. Uh, clearly, this board, uh, this investment committee and the board uh, care very much about the treatment of human capital. And we take your comments to heart. And we have uh, repeatedly uh, asked staff to engage with uh, our partners to discover uh, what is, in fact, happening, 
to the extent that it is uh, dangerous to human capital and therefore puts at risk our investment, uh, we do engage, and, and I can tell you from personal experience, uh, I have said to some of the CEOs of some of our private equity partners that this is something that everyone has to be sensitive to in this day and age. We have to be mindful of the importance of human capital. So your presence here today and your testimony here today has not gone unheard. And I promise you that we will continue to pursue our efforts uh, to get to the bottom of these things and to the extent that we can make these changes, we will. Uh, and so staff, I, I, you know, I once again direct you uh, or ask you uh, to look into these things, uh, get to the bottom of it, and report back to us. Thank you very much, people. Okay, the next item on the agenda is item number 3A, semi-annual performance reports uh, from uh, Makita. Steve, Stephanie. Great. Thank you, Chair Prezant. Steve McCourt with Makita Investment Group. Uh, with me today to my right is Stephanie Sorg. We'll be presenting uh, the open session uh, semi-annual uh, report uh, that you have in your, your, um, your material. Uh, just to remind everyone uh, the, that Makita conducts our semi-annual reports every six months. Uh, and in those, we complete a comprehensive review of the investment program and staff's execution of it. Our review includes an analysis of the investment performance and investment activity using performance calculated by your custodian bank, State Street. We also require staff complete questionnaires that cover critical components of the program and we conduct interviews with senior leaders of each uh, asset class. Further, Makita conducts enhanced monitoring of two specific asset classes uh, at CalSTRS, CIS and RMS. This involves quarterly meetings with staff and more in-depth analysis. At the broadest level, CalSTRS investment staff continues to execute at a very high level as both qualitative and quantitative measures of evaluation are overwhelmingly positive over meaningful time periods. Over the past year, the investment program has continued to evolve in complexity. To highlight a few specific areas, in 2023, the committee adopted a new asset allocation policy, which led to somewhat higher allocations to illiquid asset classes, uh, including private credit, at the expense of liquid ones. Staff has been implementing these changes since the committee adopted the revised policy. The committee has approved a target of one-fifth of CalSTRS global equity portfolio to be invested in a low carbon index. Staff has been implementing this change. The committee adopted policies that expanded asset allocation ranges and controlled the use of leverage at the total fund level. Staff is in the process of implementing uh, these new tools. Finally, the committee is re reviewing today a change in policy that will allow for a collaborative strategies allocation, building structure around the CIS program, innovation program, and a new opportunities program. Staff has approached this new framework in a cautious and thoughtful way. In short, there's been a lot going on and staff continues to execute very well. As the CalSTRS investment program continues to increase in size and complexity, so too must the committee's oversight and monitoring of the investment program. Our goal at Makita is to ensure that our semi-annual reports meet and hopefully exceed your needs and expectations in directing the investment program. If they do not, I'm sure you will let us know. <laughs> Now on, on to the investments. I will uh, provide a brief um, commentary on uh, the markets to set the context and then hand it over to, uh, to Stephanie to review some specific points on uh, your performance. 2023 was an interesting year in the markets and can probably best be described as resilient. For much of the year, uh, rising interest rates and a higher for longer uh, expectation on Fed policy acted as wet blankets on the markets uh, most mostly bond markets. Then beginning in early November, communication from the Fed gave the markets confidence that interest rates had indeed peaked and would likely decline as early as the first quarter of 2024. With that communication, bond and stock markets skyrocketed in the last two months of the year. 
And so much of the returns that we experienced were very much back end loaded. For the full calendar year, global equities were up over 20% and bond markets were up about 6%. However, not everything was positive for the year. Uh, risk mitigating strategies uh, generally produced negative returns uh, as they are intended to do or expected to do when equity markets are strongly positive. Uh, and real estate uh, as an asset class posted meaningfully negative returns as that asset class continues to deal with the COVID related dislocations uh, in uh, real estate. So with that backdrop, let me hand it over to uh, Steph to, uh, to address performance for CalSTRS specifically. Great, good morning all. Uh, just to be sure we're all able to see the trailing performance of the total portfolio in front of you on your screens, correct? We're good there, awesome. So I will summarize the results from our semi-annual report. Uh, the CalSTRS portfolio returned a positive 9.2% for the 2023 calendar year. That outpaced the policy benchmark by 80 basis points, but did lag the median peer and the reference portfolio, which you'll notice is not new to CalSTRS, but is new to our reporting here. Um, since I'm sure you're all looking at the one year return for the reference portfolio and scratching your head a little bit, I'm a big fan of disclaimers. And so just to set the scene, the reference portfolio went through an extensive review process the past 18 months and the composition was approved last September. That is a stock bond split blend. 70% of that is earmarked for public equities and the remaining 30% is for bonds. The blend was deduced from the long-term risk profile of the CalSTRS portfolio, so how we expect it to look and act over market cycles. All that to say the performance of the portfolio against the reference portfolio is most informative and meaningful over longer time periods. So if we look out over the three, five, and 10, you can see that not only does the CalSTRS portfolio outpace that reference portfolio, but also the policy benchmark and the peer median Zeroing in on the 10-year number, CalSTRS portfolio has produced an annualized 7.9% return that outpaces the policy benchmark by 40 basis points per year on average, outpaces the State Street median by 50 basis points, and meaningfully outpaces the reference portfolio by 170 basis points per year on average. Uh, a few asset class highlights for the year. Uh, the obvious first one here is global equity, making up roughly 40% of the total portfolio. It appreciated 22.2% .2 in 2023. Uh, not only should we smile at the double digit returns, but also at the fact that the asset class was able to outpace its respective benchmark by 50 basis points during a period where broadly speaking, it was extremely difficult to outpace the equity markets that were on a tear, which if we tie it back to the reference portfolio, the main reason why the benchmark was so difficult to beat over the past year is because 70% of that was appreciating 22% in 2023. But I digress, I come back to asset classes from a relative stance, private markets, which is your second largest asset class. Uh, outpaced its policy benchmark by 4.1% last year. That was strongly supported by the two underlying asset classes within that. You had real estate outpacing its benchmark by 3.9% and private equity outpacing by 1.5%. To address the red marks you're seeing in the report for the RMS portfolio, uh, this disclaimer hat goes back on. The RMS portfolio is by design intended to protect CalSTRS during market drawdowns and diversify the risk. For simplicity's sake, we like to think of it as an insurance policy. And so the negative absolute returns, as Steve mentioned, are totally within our expectations. The underperformance did warrant a little bit of review and extensive monitoring by staff and Makita. We could talk about those aspects during closed session, but I will wrap up my comments just to say that overall, the portfolio continued to grow in 2023 and outperformance is steady over all time periods. Uh, staff is executing at the policy on all levels uh, and we're happy to take questions. Any questions? I think there'll be further questions uh, when we can get more granular. Looking forward to it. Yeah, thanks. All right, next up, our real estate consultants.
Welcome, Taylor. Welcome, Ben. Good morning. <coughs> Good morning. What cheery news do you have for us? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for bringing that up. I was going to introduce myself first. Ben Maslin from RCFO <laughs> Fund Advisors, I'm here with my colleague Taylor Mammon. But it is cheery news because you are outperforming the benchmark across all time periods. Um, yeah, over the last five years, you've, your active portfolio has outperformed by 350 basis points. Over the last 10 years, by 240 basis points. Um, the one-year return has outperformed by 300 basis points. It's down 10%. Um, and the reason that real estate returns are down over the past year is because, uh, quite simply, appraisal values are lacked. And appraisers have been marking down real estate values because of capital market changes, which are primarily interest rate increases. So interest rate increases have led to cap rate increases, which is how real estate is measured. And that in turn has led to appreciation returns being lower. Um, I'll note that operating fundamentals, which Taylor will get into, are actually still quite strong uh, across most asset classes outside of office properties. Um, all, uh, all policies are in compliance. Um, the, uh, the allocation is right on target at 15%. It was previously above target, and, and as values have come down and the stock market has reached record levels, we're now right at target. Um, the loan-to-value has ticked up a little bit. That is due to appraisal values declining while, while debt levels have remained relatively steady. Uh, looking at the diversification, uh, the portfolio continues to be um, overweight office. When you look at it at the surface level, when you dig in a little bit deeper, and you inc this includes life science properties. So when you strip out life science properties, you're basically at the benchmark in terms of your office allocation. Um, you are still underweight industrial and multifamily properties, which are two of the, the better performing property types. And that is something that staff is working on to continue to deploy those property types. With that, I'll turn it over to Taylor. Fantastic. Again, Taylor Mammon from Marcielka Fund Advisors. Again, we're very, very happy to be here with you this morning. I, I just wanted to provide. I'm sorry. Excuse me. I apologize. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, Sharon, please. Can I just ask a quick question, Ben? Of course. Life science properties. So when I hear that, I have not heard that term that couched that way. I don't know if that's a real estate term. I think biotech, is that right? Am I thinking about that right? Or can you? It's, it's, it's synonymous. Yeah, we, we, um, it includes biotech. So I know uh, like in Boston and Cambridge, we have. Cambridge Crossing is a good Cambridge example. Cambridge Crossing, uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay, so that's, I just wanted to make sure I was. Great. Right. Thank you. Please, yeah. please, anytime we use jargon, just stop <laughs> us in our tracks. We'll correct it. Thank you. I just wanted to make two um, high-level observations regarding the real estate markets, that, which are the context in which the Calsters real estate staff are investing and evaluating existing assets. The first, which, which Ben mentioned, can really be illustrated by the charts at the bottom, which show vacancy and rent growth across the, the major private real estate asset classes and generally show fairly positive uh, current performance as well as projected uh, performance with of course the notable exception of office real estate but office is is, is really just a just a com uh, becoming a smaller component of the overall basket of uh, property types um, this office performance though will uh, be a drag on performance going forward of both the real estate market generally as well as the Calsters portfolio it's a drag as uh, operating fundamentals continue to decline. Uh, valuations that are on the books of uh, indices as well as uh, pension funds like Calsters may take a while to catch up to where transaction values are actually taking place, where office stocks are taking place, and we think that happens over time. And we do think that office real estate may pose continued pressure on, in particular, regional and community banks um, that could create uh, challenges associated with debt refinancing, liquidity, 
and you know, could, could could cause overall problems for the economy as as well. So we think the the implications of office will largely be balanced by strong performance in other asset classes, but did really just really create a drag on on overall performance. And then the second observation that I'd make, which is somewhat related to this, is that. Most of the industry, and really Calsters included, have spent much more time over the past 12 months uh, playing defense as opposed to offense, you know, dealing with existing portfolios rather than investing in new real estate. And you can see that in the, the contributions or new investments that have been made by staff more recently. And this is driven, of course, by what we've talked about before, the denominator effect, which is essentially the fact that when the rest of the market goes down, real estate, which is valued as a private asset, and therefore lags, um, increases in overall allocation. So that's that's largely corrected itself with the stock market um, run that, that occurred in the fourth quarter of last year. But, but we're really just getting to the point where real estate is back to its allocation. Um, valuation uncertainty has been an issue that has prevented transactions. Um, staff everywhere has had to spend time managing debt maturities and problems within office real estate. And, um, and, and finally, and importantly, there have really been fairly limited attractive opportunities to date in real estate. There's been a tremendous amount of capital raised to take advantage of distress or near-term problems within portfolios. But those aren't necessarily emerging yet. And again, they're very concentrated on the office property type, which isn't getting a lot of investment investors excited at this point in time. And so just to understand the context, that's what most institutional investors have been focused on is kind of dealing with the existing portfolios. Though we expect that to change within the next 12 months. I suspect we'll have a different type of conversation in September as opportunities start to emerge as, um, as again, the real estate portfolio, the problems that are within it start getting dealt with and, and so on, and, um, and, and new investment opportunities uh, take place. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll pause and uh, we can open up the conversation to questions. Uh, Sharon. I don't know if my, there we go. Um, just in, in traveling around, when I go different places, I like to walk around cities and, you know, especially in Los Angeles, I see so much, you know, luxury condos and so many office buildings are being transformed into luxury condos. Um, and I just wondered if you could talk to us about how you think about the whole issue around affordable housing and sort of what is our role or how do you see our role? Because I, I see the breakout of multifamily, office, retail, industrial. We all know the issues, I mean, in my neighborhood of, I mean, people are paying so much more in rent than I'm paying in a mortgage across the street. So I just wondered if you could opine on that, what you're hearing kind of in the real estate world and, and how you see us playing a role. Obviously, we have teachers that can't afford to right. buy homes um, or to live near their schools. I know in community colleges, we have um, faculty that are driving 30 minutes, 45 minutes to their campuses. Um, so they're not part of that community, which to me is ultimately, you know, the, right. the best situation is to be part of the community that we're serving in. So could you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So I'm happy to go first. And Ben, if you have anything to add, please do. So this this is a fundamental challenge, probably the one of the single greatest challenges within real estate and, 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 and certainly in society. It's, it's certainly acute in California, but it's not limited to California. It's become fairly widespread at this point. And, and part of the challenge, let's say the fundamental challenge is that we just simply haven't delivered enough housing in the United States in the past 15 years at, at this point. We've, uh, we, we've experienced far more household formation, people moving out of their parents' houses, uh, immigration to different markets or from different countries and so on, all leads to household formation. Uh, and we haven't delivered anywhere near enough houses. Some estimates are as much as four to six million excess households in the United States States relative to housing that's been produced over the past 15 years. And there's also a fundamental challenge associated with building affordable housing. Almost by definition, something that is built from scratch 
is more expensive than than something that already exists. Um, to, to, and, and so it's not necessarily a problem we can immediately build ourselves out of if we want to deliver more affordable housing. But what happens in, in the housing market is that when you build a brand new building, a luxury multifamily building or, lu or luxury condo building, that which used to be luxury is no longer luxury. It becomes more market rate. That which was market rate no longer becomes market rate. It becomes more affordable and that you know, kind of creates a market. So unfortunately, this is not a problem that I think the real estate industry or the government or society can solve immediately, but we need to start building more housing in order to start dealing with the challenges that, that, our, that our areas are facing. In addition, we need to build different types of housing. I mean, right, right now, the the market is heavily concentrated in for sale single family homes which by definition have long commutes from where people work and are relatively expensive more expensive than ever as a result of interest rate increases or apartments you know stacked flats that work very well as we all know for people in their 20s and maybe early 30s but when we get kids and big animals and so on we we gen tend to need more space and so we're we're very focused with a number of clients including calsters on delivering other types of housing that might f fill the gaps between those two um uh, ends of the spectrum, like single family rental, for example, which might include townhome rentals and others that are that can be developed in more infill settings and are essentially more affordable to more of the, the, the housing segments. Patrick, Mr. Henning. Thank you, Bill. Um, I, it's something very similar to the question that was just asked. I'm, I'm really struggling with the vacancy has increased over the last year when, as you just pointed out, the demand is so incredibly high. And, and I imagine that's because of the type of multifamily housing that we're invested in, we're invested in, I would imagine, as you deemed it, luxury, is that? Right. So we're invested in luxury housing, the demand is at the low and moderate and medium affordable. Yeah, yeah sorry. Is that just, fair? Just, I'm, I'm just. For, first, a clarification, which yeah. is that what you're seeing on the chart here is for the United States in total. So this is okay. this is all uh, multifamily rental housing units in the United States. This is not Calster's portfolio, which we're happy to discuss those specific numbers in closed session. Um, but yeah. but really, what's happening is that the the pushing of rents has driven um, driven some turnover, and that has led to vacancy rates on average in the United States in creeping up a little bit. Actually, I think I, I would add to that very importantly. We actually saw a record number of multifamily deliveries yeah. in 2023. That it just simply takes time for that real estate to be absorbed. Um, and in particular, we saw a record number in the Sunbelt states, markets like Dallas, Austin, and so on, that even though uh, they're growing very quickly, we actually ended up delivering more units during a point in time than, um, than the market could absorb in 2023. But, but as you can see, that is projected to uh, be absorbed over time and generate lower vacancies. You know, one, one additional observation there is that what you, we have a large number of deliveries that are being delivered last year, this year, um, construction starts are coming down though. So, so what that will mean is that the deliveries that will be, that in, in three years from now, there'll be fewer deliveries and that in turn will drive vacancy down as well. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Gail Miller. Thank you. Um, just in terms of the, when, when we sort of look at the commercial space and we talk about kind of biotech and life sciences, class A versus everyone else, just, you know, lots of, lots of conversations out there, obviously lots and lots of concern just about the return to work, what happens, what we do with it, sort of just a, a little bit of a crystal ball question, almost an impossible one, but, but what is the trajectory and how do we, I guess, one, is there an opportunity with distressed assets that I know Mr. DeRay thinks about and works on just in terms of, of how and, and what we can do kind of going forward to the extent we have any of the not class A? And then what, what you see in terms of some of these big transformations of these big commercial properties and... Yeah, maybe, sure. maybe some opportunities since you started with good news. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, and and we were talking about this with um, with Mr. Gunning earlier as well. That that I think the good news is is that our that our downtowns, which in the United States have been predominantly single use downtowns, so really only office, 
are likely to see much more diversification of uses over the next 10 years as municipalities and the market really tries to figure out what to do with what, what is today an excess supply of office space and in particular old office space. And we are seeing uh, valuations and transactions of office start to take place um, at values that can support conversion to, to other uses. It's not universal, it's going to take time. Sometimes like a, a debt maturity or loan maturity might need to take place before an, a, a building comes to market. And that, again, that takes time to go through this conversion process. But I think what we will see is um, uh, as, as values start to decline and as those transactions take place, the buyers of those, of those buildings will either be able to convert them to housing, which of course is going to continue to be in demand, hotels, um, better office buildings than they were before in order to capture the remaining demand, uh, data centers, self-storage centers. We're seeing a, a lot of creativity in, in the market here, um, but we think it takes time, just, just dr dr driven by um, the, the fact that real estate moves slowly and, uh, and these maturities come slowly as well. Yeah, I'll just add, um, I think the, the hybrid model of employees being in the office part-time, employees working from home part-time is, is here to stay for the long term. Um, you can you can track key card swipes at Class A office buildings. There's a, uh, a company that that really has 80% of the office buildings under its its umbrella, and it, it publishes data on that, which measures the physical occupancy in a building. And so on av that, that has plateaued over the last year. So on average, employees are in their building 50% of the time today, which is which is the hybrid model of, of two and a half to three days a week. Um, we think that's here to stay. That in turn leads to um, some, you know, demand demand uh, declines for office buildings as a result. So where is the distress? The distress today is is focused primarily in office. Um, we haven't seen widespread distress in other property types because of the numbers on the page here, which which haven't seen a spike in, in vacancy rates for other property types. Um, and and the crystal ball. Where will the distress be? It will continue to be an office. Um, I'm not well, sure that's not if we'll a see crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> I want the solution. So look out the window. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well, it's good news and bad news, right? The good news is that there isn't widespread distress, in our opinion. And then, just in terms of the the folks sort of like dropping off the keys and waving goodbye, or do you think that? we've seen the worst of that, just leaving these office buildings or we, no. No, again, because those decisions are really driven by the specific timing of debt covenant breaches, loan maturities and so on, and that just takes place over time. So we're probably at the, at the beginning end of that cycle. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> any other questions? Uh, that prompted a question, that remark, uh, what is the projection of uh, maturity of debt uh, in the next two quarters? I mean, uh, in, in terms of, I mean, there's got to be some analysis yeah, yeah. of this. Yeah, and, and of course, because I was put on the spot, I'm blanking on the numbers. But I can get back Good. to you. I know. <laughs> it, we, we can get back to you later with, you know, a great deal of specifics on that. I, you know, if, I, I think the um, the specific estimate is that for... Real estate overall, the, and by the way, taking a really quick step back, most real estate debt is fairly short term, five years or less. And so you always see many more maturities or much higher volume of maturities, take, maturities taking place in the next couple of years than, than over time. That's just the nature of things. So um, in the next couple of years, the amount of debt that needs to be refinanced or you know, sold uh, through transactions is in the hundreds of mil billions of dollars. I think within office, people are looking at $50 billion, but I'm going to correct that number as soon as I get back to my chair and can, it's, can look it's it It's higher up. than that for office. We have a chart on this, but I don't remember the number off the top of my head either. Right. So we'll, we'll send and, it over. And one other question. What is the... Uh, status of mortgage-backed mortgage securities in some of these regional banks? So the um, 
typically the the challenge that the regional banks have is that they do a lot of their lending on balance sheet and so not necessarily securitizing the loans and putting them into kind of the institutional syndication syndicate syndi yeah. Yeah, market so um that and that again that's that's the fundamental problem is that they the, the regional banks are holding these loans on their books um, and those that have very high concentrations to real estate and in particular office um, are going to realize losses on those loans. They haven't sufficiently securitized them in order to spread out the risk. Okay. Any other further questions? Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, again, thank you uh, for your good work, uh, Ben and Taylor, and we look forward to discussing with you uh, you know, the, uh, the more specifics uh, in closed session. But before you leave, uh, uh, are there any public comments? There are no members of the public in the queue right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, uh, our private equity team uh, of consultants, uh, John and Tad. Come to the table, please. Hello, John Haggerty, Makita Investment Group. I'm joined by Tad. We're going to go through our semi-annual report. I have a couple comments I'd like to make uh, before we do that uh, to say some general things about the asset class. It is 14% of your allocation, your NAV, but it is 25% of your risk budget. So it plays a very important role in driving returns, and it's where you take a lot of your risk in terms of expected volatility and the illiquidity that you take by, by allocating to that part of the market. I'm happy to say, and we've emphasized this in many of our reports, it's delivered. And our report will that goes through November, uh, December, uh, sep September of last year will, will illustrate that. It's the best performing asset class for your, your pension fund and has been since inception. Your program is performing well uh, versus your stock market benchmark, which includes a liquidity premium of 150 basis points, as well as a measure of the private equity market. It, your program is also operating within its guidelines. Last meeting, we heard from your staff about forecasting cash flows and the pacing modeling, and I want to talk a little bit about that. We noted then, and we'll note again today, and it comes up in our report, there's been a slowdown in distributions, and that's a result of some dynamics in the market that have to do with some of the uncertainty about pricing and uncertainty about the economy that resulted in a widening of a bid-ask spread for the period that we're talking about with this report. This contributed to private equity nearing the upper bound of the policy range that you had had uh, prior to this year. So it, you're getting close to the 17%, which was the 14 plus the 3% range. Uh, and as of January, you've increased that with wider bands of plus or minus 5%, which takes you to a 19% upper bound, which we think will be providing important flexibility to your pension fund over time to avoid forced selling in the market if that were ever to be the case, because you take fairly significant discounts if you were forced to sell any of these assets. I want to fast forward to beyond our reporting period just quickly, because it's a bit of nice news with respect to what I was talking about with the bid-ask spread, the slowing down of distributions. The, it's just one quarter, but the fourth quarter, which, which followed the reporting period that we're going through, was cash flow positive, and also year-to-date, we're seeing the same thing. We had felt like, through our own modeling, we were getting close to a tipping point when you had aggressively sought the 14% target, going from 8% to 14 and that involved a lot of contributions, and we had thought that we would see a turn in the cash flow dynamics of the portfolios. We're seeing that a little bit. You may also remember staff reported in their own discussion of, of cash flow modeling the potential for net positive net cash flow in the range of $10 billion to, to $20 billion over the next five years. I'm going to talk a little bit about deployment. Uh, your staff has reacted to not only the market, but also some of these characteristics that I was talking about, the lack of distributions coming back by deploying less than the budget. It was roughly half 
uh, the deployment that the budget had for 2023, $4.4 billion roughly. And that's the result of responding to pacing modeling. It's also the result of responding to relevant deal flow being less but also setting a higher bar for the investments that were made for the program and focusing investments on core relationships and ones in which the staff had higher conviction. I'm also gonna mention co-investments in the markets briefly, and then we'll get to our official report. But co-investments, as you know, is the, the important expression of the collaborative model, the cost reduction through special relationships with, with general partners. And we're happy to report, that we have the statistics for it a bit later, that the co-investments are outperforming your fund investments, and it represents almost a quarter of your, your total deployment, 22% so as of the 930 snapshot that we'll show you in a moment. And this is also an area that we proposed, Tad and I and the rest of Makita, that we focus on with respect to education and doing a little bit of a deeper dive into the analysis of where you're getting returns and what the risks and the rewards are specifically with, with co-investments. So more to come from us on the co-investment front. And then lastly, the markets, and I'll get to our official report after that. Here's some of the good news in addition to the performance that I mentioned. Uh, there was a slowdown, as you know, in deal making that, that led to the slowdown in distributions, but we're seeing a little bit of a reversal in that. There was a difference of opinion, of course, between what sellers thought their assets were worth and what buyers thought they were worth. But that bid-ask spread has is, is been narrowing, and we're seeing that happening in the market subsequent to this report. And what that means is more deals are getting done, more sales, more distributions, and that's part of the reason why we're seeing that, that cash flow profile change just a bit for your portfolio. I'm also happy to say that banks, we've talked about the big opportunity in private credit being that banks are retreating from that market. We're seeing something kind of somewhat the opposite of that benefiting the buyout market. Buyouts, of course, uh, require a certain amount of, of leverage to, to get the transaction done. Banks pulling back was a force for higher costs. Banks are coming back into that market and we're observing lower costs for borrowing for buyout transactions which is good for a whole lot of things. Transactions pick up, distributions come back, uh, and it, it also reduces the, it allows for the underwriting of individual deals to be at a higher you know, gross um, expected return for your plan. So with that um, long preamble to our report, I'll go to the first page. <laughs> um, and just mention, uh, you know, again, our first point is the same as I just mentioned. Um, slow fundraising market, and this is mostly because, like yourselves, uh, a lot of the other limited partners, pension funds, endowments, et cetera, were either at their target for private equity or over their, their target. And there was just a reticence to, to commit to funds as well. So general partners were having a tough time raising capital over the period of time that our report covers here. There was also a slowdown. Um, in the amount of time it took to raise funds, creating a fairly big backlog of funds in the market. We show over 10,000 funds in the market as of the snapshot of our semi-annual report, which is remarkable, probably the highest number that's ever existed. Uh, the, another positive that I'll dwell upon here, and it's reflected already in the valuations of your portfolio, so you have to fear a price drop leading to some kind of shoe dropping with respect to your performance. I would look at this as a positive sign on a prospective basis that the measure of a price on a deal in buyouts, 3.2 times EBITDA, that's a, a measure of cash flow or free cash flow, that was the number in 2021 describing the price of the market. You can think about that as like a price to earnings ratio for the stock market. And that number uh, year to date as of your reporting period was down to 10.4%. So going forward, much cheaper prices to be paid for, for buy transactions. So, so I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the 10.4 the, uh, uh, times EBITDA was at uh, the end of the third quarter of last year? Is Correct. That, okay, great. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Tad to go through your actual performance for the, the period ending September 30. 
<clears throat> so I'll try not to be too repetitive, but just <clears throat> want to reiterate a little bit of what John has already covered. Um, as you mentioned, the private equity program continues to perform well. It has delivered uh, in generating strong double-digit returns over the latest three, five, and 10-year periods and outperforming both benchmarks over these time periods. And I just want to uh, send a, spend a minute to clarify on the benchmarks and how those are utilized. So the custom State Street Index is a peer private equity universe that is supposed intended to be utilized over the shorter and interim time periods to more of an apples to apples kind of comparison on the performance. And you can see the program has outperformed all periods except for the since inception. Uh, so in line with what we, you know, and better than what we, we would expect. And then the custom benchmark is your public equity plus a premium benchmark, which cover covers performance relative to the MSCI ACWI. And this is the one year number you can see has significant underperformance. And this is what happens when you have the mismatch of benchmarks between public equity and private equity in the shorter time periods. So this benchmark is truly intended to be measured over a longer period. While we show it over all periods, it's really expected to be looked at for 10 years or longer. So I really want to draw your attention to that number where the program has generated a 10-year number of 13% uh, uh, average annual return uh, and outperforming this benchmark, benchmark by over 400 basis points. So overall, continued strong performance of the private equity program. On the next slide, we'll get a little bit more on what's driving this results. these results. <clears throat> Buyouts, which represent the largest proportion of the portfolio at about 77% of NAV, has generated strong absolute and relative results across all periods evaluated. So this is truly what's driving the overall aggregate results and, and being very additive to your overall program. Venture capital, which is a much smaller uh, proportion of the program, targeted to be 10% and slightly below that 8%. As we've discussed in prior reports, this is a, a segment of the private equity markets that is very difficult to access at scale. Um, there are many opportunities in the peer universe that are much smaller, harder, you know, capacity constrained that the largest institutional investors cannot get exposure. So, you know, while there's been underperformance over longer periods, it's still generated strong absolute results, but the underperformance relative to the peers is not is understandable and understood. But also want to highlight while it hasn't the, that space has not captured the upside, uh, quite all the upside over the long term, it's also not capturing as much of the downside over the near term as the venture capital space has uh, exhibited declines over the latest year. Can I? I'm sorry again to just interrupt just to get some more uh, context here. Uh, in terms of our private equity portfolio, what percentage is allocated to venture? Currently, the exposure is 8% with a target of to 10%. So the debt-related and special mandates, which are also smaller exposures within the program, have had mixed uh, relative results depending on the time period. We just want to highlight that the special mandates um, has had much improved interim results over the three and five year period as there's been an evolution of the program from more prior direct partnership commitments to more diversified uh, exposures that's really improved those results over time. But the key metric is that the buyouts continue to be performing well, largest proportion of your program, and really uh, driving overall results. And, and again, let me interrupt uh, just for some of the newer members uh, and those of us that don't have a memory. Um, it, it, tell us what special mandates include. Yeah, so that's, uh, there's a, a couple different mandates, but it's smaller emerging managers, um, diverse manager mandates. So there's a um, multitude of different strategies, but the smaller emerging manager diverse uh, orientations. Thank you. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Kiley. You're up. Well, there we go. Tad, you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you quickly mentioned why the performance of the special mandates during the median turn has seen improve, dramatic improvement. And I, I didn't catch your, your uh, uh, explanation. Could you just repeat that? Yeah, so there's been an evolution of the overall program. Initially, the inception of the program, large commitments were made directly to uh, individual partnerships. And there's some concentration risk and you know there's some more variability in some of these opportunities. 
and some do not perform well dampening long-term results. It's been moved, you know, the, the exposures have been moved more to separately managed accounts. So you have managers creating diversified portfolios of these smaller emerging managers. And so that kind of extra layer of diversification and manager selection has resulted in improved performance over time. Thank you. Here we show co-investment performance versus fund performance. And have to say for the, the 10 year, the five year period of time, there's a quite a bit of additional return out of the co-investments. If we just compare the middle line to the bottom line, you see and for the five year period of time, 220 basis points of additional return coming out of co-investments. And for the 10 year period of time, that 15.8 380 basis points or 280 basis points over the, the overall private equity program. What we propose to do is to answer some additional questions with our reporting going forward and potentially do a separate session on it to, to disaggregate that additional return. Is it fees? Is it other things? What, what is helping and what is hurting that? Uh, fee savings would be the number one thing you'd think of. But there are other some smaller, subtle factors there that, that hinder that return. You're not getting subscription line leverage that the funds get that doesn't exist for the co-investments. But we also would want to look at typical things like, is there any bias towards larger deals, smaller deals? Is there any bias towards growth versus value and some other aspects of that? So that's what we propose as another area to, to do a deep dive on the go forward Yeah, basis. I appreciate that. Um, I also would... would uh ask you to consider uh, to the extent that some of these co-investments also include a uh, equity interest in the underlying investment vehicle, uh, and one of which, you know, has just gone public. And so there is a way to measure the value of that. Uh, and, it, you know, to the extent that we can start looking at those uh, investments made uh, during the collaborative model uh, with co-investments and equity uh, or profit share in the vehicle itself, the investment vehicle itself, how we might value that. Absolutely. Because that, that is going to be an essential, uh, I think, contributor to uh, the uh, fund because it's going to have uh, you know, net value. Absolutely. Okay. So from an analytical point of view, we reached uh, a tipping point in two ways. One, it's almost a quarter of the portfolio, so it, ha it, ha it merits a, a bit more analysis. But further, we have robust data set now to take a look at, given the number of co-investments that have been done since the program really became recharged a couple of years ago. Anything further? Um, you're doing really well in in, uh, in your European investments. Uh, we say this every time, but it's just worth noting: 330 basis points uh, better than the, the benchmark. There, it's been a big driver of performance within buyouts. And um, here, I'll say specifically: in spite of what the bar show, your staff deploys very, very consistently over time. It's an artifact of what labels something a 21 vintage fund. Uh, that makes that bar look a little higher. It's it's a really important point to drive home every time we talk to you, because there's no market timing to be done in this space, and your your staff is not seeking to market time. And then you quickly, you're within your your policy parameters, is shown here. And then lastly, this is really just the summation of it. Um, I do show the 16.5% um, NAV of the portfolio, which does show that you got close to that 17% upper end of the target in September. And, um, and now that the policy bands are wider, such that the upper band is now 19%. And uh, one last thing, uh, you had asked us to keep you updated on the policy change that you made back in early 2022 where you granted the authority to do bigger co-investment deals. And we're here to say we haven't seen that flexibility used as of yet, and we'll report to you um, on when it has been. Okay. The activity has been consistent with respect to the size of the deals. Great. Thank you. And that concludes our report. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Gail Miller, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is really helpful, and I just huge shout out to the team. That slide on co-investment, Wow, I mean that showing just to be really clear on having 
out, literally outpacing funds is just phenomenal. So just a huge proof point about the collaborative model, huge proof point about leadership and this ability to execute. I just, incredible. Um, on the, the pacing piece, uh, Mr. Haggerty, I do want to sort of, so obviously just talk a little bit about pacing as a challenge. So because we're seeing these high growth rates in the in private equity and the private funds, um, obviously how, how it's going to really lead to this long-term value in our fund. If you could talk a little bit about the challenges of pacing and then how the steps we've taken to be a little bit more nimble in terms of, of leverage and liquidity, just how you see all of that sort of working together to ensure that, that we're able to act quickly. But again, I mean, I, I just, I don't know, I assume CalSTRS is best in class in, in terms of their ability to execute um, with, and so I, I, again, just huge congratulations. But I also think important for the board to understand pacing challenges and, and what we as a board could do to mitigate it, and then just explaining the recent policies that that helped yeah. that as well. So um, this may be skating out of my own lane just a little bit, but I would say liquidity management will largely be done at the, the total portfolio level, and that was the subject of, of discussion at the last meeting. But there's lots of things that individual asset classes that are illiquid can do. And I, I'm happy to say that your private equity team is doing everything that I could conceive of to do that. One of the things that they focused on in January was doing the best forecasting that you can. And that's a difficult challenge. You don't control the cash flows of this part of your portfolio. You, you ask the general partner to call the capital when they need it for the investment and distribute it back when they've sold in an optimal fashion. So you can't control that. So the best that you can do is look at historical data and patterns and tendencies of different types of funds and try to forecast that and make adjustments from time to time when the market's acting in an unusual way, which is what I've really dwelled upon with my presentation. So your staff has done this and we've done this, and I believe they were able to work with four independently created models, including one from Makita, to make sure that there is nothing better that one could do to forecast that, that net cash flow you know, forecast for the total private equity program. So they're doing that. The other obvious things that one would do within an asset class that's a liquid is to look at things you might do under extreme circumstances, which I would argue, and I, again, I might be out of my lane here in categorizing how the markets feel, but these would be things that you would do in another market circumstance, which we contemplate selling or contemplate taking on leverage within the liquid asset class using class collateral, your existing investments. Your staff looks at those, those possibilities on a regular basis and is in touch with secondary managers that could broker you know, a sale if it ever were to happen. But I want to be clear that um, that seems to be a remote possibility right now. But it's still smart to engage in those discussions and see what you might be able to garner if selling, uh, selling in the secondary market. And the other would be contacting potential leverage providers that would allow you to get liquidity based on the collateral that you could provide with the existing assets in the private equity portfolio. So it's just good practice and smart to prepare for very unlikely things, but your staff and we is doing that constantly and it's something we talk about every every four weeks or so with staff. So Mr. Chan, I see you have come up to the, the uh, microphone and, and probably mm -hmm. could tell us what staff, in fact, is doing? <laughs> well, yes, my name is Scott Chan. I'm the uh, deputy CIO. And I think John actually did a, a really uh, a decent job here in describing um, all of the components working together. But I think to Gail's point, um, what we've been focusing on is total fund management, right? And so Mike DeRay, our senior investment director of private markets, has done a great job of really honing in on, on pacing across all of the private markets. And so we're getting better and better at pacing. And, you know, <clears throat> we've seen, you know, John just talk about the, the private markets. It ebbs and flows. Um, transactions are coming back a little bit, but over the last couple of years, there's like 50 to 80% reduction in the amount of transactions. And while our NAV in, in, the pri in private equity, for example, is twice the amount of 
um, what our commitments are, meaning that we should be cash flow positive generally almost every year. It hasn't been that way. Why? Because companies haven't been exiting, right? So we're going to go through these periods where we're you know, cash flow, flow rich and cash flow poor. And so now, as, as Gail was mentioning, uh, due to the board's um, adoption of our leverage policy, we do have more tools to manage those ups and downs of the cash flow. Um, and I, th I would say we're, we're very, very much um, in position if there's a market dislocation, right? So we talked about how we might want to rebalance the portfolio. For example, we've gone through crises where the equity markets have been down 20, 30, 40 percent, et cetera. And so if we're that far off our asset allocation, um, that could pose a great risk you know, for us reaching that. So should we be using, for example, equity derivatives to flow back into the market? Anyways, I think to Gail's point, it was, it was more about as we construct the portfolio and target the strategic asset allocation that the board is, has called us to, um, the market is going to be moving dynamically, sometimes really dynamically. And we have more and more tools, and we've been more working on a total fund basis to tie all this to, together. And I would say today we're, we're really in a great position um, if there were to be, for example, a, a market dislocation or if the markets continue to be you know, somewhat frozen in terms of transactions. So right. just or, adding to what, what John was saying at, at the total fund level. Or an opportunity to. All right. Uh, Sharon, you have a question. I do. I, um, this is, it's great to hear how well, and I hear this a lot from my other trustee colleagues about how well private equity is performing um, for their funds here in the U.S. And um, I, think, I think, honestly, more recently, I've just had different anecdotal experiences in healthcare in particular. Um, and even watching the Super Bowl, I remember hearing a commenter talking about potentially private equity getting involved in like partial ownership of NFL teams. I mean, it it kind of feels like private equity is buying everything. <laughs> it feels like a sci-fi novel to me a little bit, which um, and um, and so I just I guess I wanted to ask you more about how we at Calsters and how are you as our consultants overseeing kind of the human capital piece of private equity? I mean, plenty of articles demonizing private equity. I don't need to reiterate that, the gutting of America, plundering. Um, I assume we're best practices and that we're obviously trying to be the investor of choice in these arenas. But I think on nursing homes, healthcare, you hear a lot of, to me, like a misalignment of kind of short-term versus our long-term, you know, sort of investor perspective. And it, it, it feels to me when I look at some of these deals, it's kind of like if, if private equity loses, there's still no consequences to, to them. And they still kind of come out, they can leave, you know, the relationship and, and put their money somewhere else. But the, the, the workers and the organization and the previous, you know, employees of the company are left holding the bag. We saw what happened with Toys R Us. And I mean, there's a litany of those issues. And so I, I guess I'm I'm hoping, and I, I know talking to staff, like how how do you see us ensuring? Because you talked about our risk too. I think you said 25% of the risk budget, right, for private equity. Correct. How are we um, ensuring that? Again, I'm not saying we shouldn't be in private equity because obviously the returns are great. How are we managing the human capital risk in private equity and those relationships? And how, you know, how are you providing kind of a second pair of eyes to ensure? Because um, I, I feel like I hear a lot about, oh, we're, you know, it, it's always two or three layers away. And, and I, I think I've been on this board long enough to feel like... Uh, I don't think that's an effective response anymore. I think we're the money and we should be more engaged in, in these relationships to ensure that workers are treated fairly, paid fairly, and that these um, companies are run in a, in a way that's fair to workers. And, and I certainly, yeah, I'm just, I'm just conscious of healthcare in Los Angeles. It, every time I go now to a doctor, it's being bought up by private equity. And I'm not saying that I'm, it's neutral, I guess, but I'm worried about, you know, doctors are selling their practices and, you know, and, and that's a dynamic over time that you see how potentially we get away from, you know, home offices and home, home clinics and it's, it's owned by big, you know, big private equity. So I just wonder if you could talk about the human capital piece 
Um, are you concerned about that? I mean, this is your world. Um, so, uh, and then, yeah. Yeah. So um, we try to tackle that in a couple of ways. So first I would say, unfortunately, you should brace yourself for more scrutiny. The private equity market relative to the public market is just going to get bigger. And so we all need to be preparing ourselves for more scrutiny. Uh, I don't have any evidence that the behaviors of private equity owners of businesses are worse than public. Uh, but it is often an easier story to tell when a specific name with a specific compensation model owns outright versus public ownership of, of a company that may have some, some faults in behavior. Mm -hmm. I would also say that I do think that there is true alignment between, or should be, between labor and limited partners that are simply return seeking. I think it is widely regarded as bad business to have these behaviors or discord with labor. Um, it's unproductive. Uh, it's if you're simply looking from a dollars and cents point of view, it doesn't look good. But it's but rarely is a private equity strategy predicated on treating labor badly. It can seem that way, and I think it can be spun that way, but I'm not personally aware of strategies that exist in your portfolio or broadly uh, that seek to make additional returns or simply by you know, treating labor badly or cutting corners or squeezing labor in any way. Now, what, are, what are we doing about it? What are you doing about it? Um, I know that your staff asks a lot of questions. And that's often kind of the first stage with, with these sorts of matters. You have a formal due diligence questionnaire that, asks, that gets at the labor question in a number of ways. One, one question is, do you participate in the UN PRI principles, which has a labor component to it? And there are also specific labor questions that are in the due diligence questionnaire that managers get. At a minimum, that will highlight any existing or any prior problems that have existed between labor and the manager so that your staff will go in with fresh eyes and presumably will have a bias against groups that have had some persistent problems in labor <coughs> relations. So it is something that is looked at, it's something that is discussed. Uh, specific questions are asked about the history of the manager with respect to labor relations, but also policies, they're, act to, they're asked to react to policies that are put forth in, in your diligence questionnaire specifically. And so they at least have to put it in writing to you how they regard these policies. And I, and I, um, and I, I think beyond that, I, I don't know of any specific litmus tests. I don't know if that, if that would be even appropriate given your fiduciary responsibilities. Yeah. yeah I just wanted to make a few comments on the back of, of John's. Um, because I think, um, Sharon, I, you know, we all struggle with the dichotomy between public and private markets because in the public markets we cer certainly have governance rights right we have proxy votes and we it's transparent uh, we don't have that in the private markets and the mechanism really is about engagement right us our staff engaging them what, what i could say is i think we do have an advantage in managing these risks because we have a, a well-developed team of professionals and you you're going to need to you know engage every partner. And so as John was saying, we have surveys. That's just a starting point, really, to ask questions and engage deeply with each of our partners. The second thing I would say is because more and more we're relying on the private markets, the company is getting larger, and more of the um, market of companies and corporations is staying private um, and growing and growing, um, that our engagement also is now extending more to the portfolio <coughs> company level. And many of the, as an example, many of the uh, partners that we have, they have dedicated folks who then are going to focus on the operating part of the operating company. And so I know that our staff knows them and is engaging them on all these issues as well. So just wanted to give you um, a little bit more of a picture, but I personally think that we're, we're in a very good position because it's about engagement and you have to have a, a really well-developed staff to do that, and we, we certainly do, so. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Gunning. I think Chris. 
Oh, Chris, you wanna, did you want to? I'm sorry. Just a real quick comment I wanted to add. Chris Hellman, Chief Investment Officer for the fund. I have to say that for the <laughs> typing the minutes. Um, John, you had a slide. I can't remember. Was it 1,000 firms, or did you see there were 10,000 10, private 10, equity 000. firms? 10,000. 10, 10, 10, so, and I think, Sharon, that's one of the challenges is that the industry has gotten, it's very top heavy. Obviously, there's like 80% of the capital is run by probably, I don't know, 20, 25 firms. But that proliferation down in the middle, and, and I don't know at all about the healthcare workers, but I'm going to speculate that that's probably that smaller middle market. And when you think about 10,000, that means we we basically have a relationship with 10% or less of that swath. And, and what I'm picking up from that industry, like anywhere, there are lots of bad actors down in that small middle market that we'll never invest with because they're already tiny and they probably just deal with high net worth individuals and doctors and those kind of people. So I think that industry is still going to get a bad reputation. The people at the top haven't done a good job either. Uh, they've made their own bed and that's their problem. You know, we are, and, and Bill and I are going back to New York to meet with the industry representatives to really share our point of view and our issue about workers, worker rights, worker equity. And, and you know, I think I can say for the head of their uh, association, who I talked to about just two days ago, um, they know that their industry is under attack, has a bad reputation, and is under legislative, regulatory attack. So that's what they recognize. Their problem is the big firms know it. All these thousands of small firms don't know it because they're at state levels or regional levels. So we're going to do our best at the top, and I want to do my best post-retirement to, you know, I'm not going to defend the private equity industry, but I'm going to do my best to try and get it to act better because it's, Unfortunately, part of the capital markets, it's almost half of the capital markets in the USA, and it's going to be around for a long time, Europe, U.S., and Asia. Here, here. Uh, Mr. Gunning. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chris. That really was my thought, and Sharon as well, which is we are facing Senate, U.S. Senate legislative oversight. They're, they're looking into this, and I guess that's the concern is, is there a thought about how to deal with that? And Chris, that might be the association you're mentioning, but that would be the next risk for, for, in my mind is that it get regulated. Okay, uh, Chairman Kiley, you're back. Yeah. <laughs> thank, Observations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> is that a pregnant pause? Um, I want to thank John for your, uh, thank my colleague, uh, Ms. Hendricks, for her question. I thought your answer was very thoughtful, John, and I thank you for that, and our staff's uh, comments as well. And knowing the history of the role that private equity has played and the report that Makita gave to us about our why we're invested in private equity, we assume returns we can expect going forward are going to potentially be suppressed. There's a lot of risks associated with investing in private equity. We hear about those concerns that are brought to us at almost every one of our meetings. And at the same time, we're trying to pay pension promises to teachers. I, I would encourage you uh, and Makita on a forward-looking basis um, to highlight for us uh, us being the investment committee as well as our team, when and where you think there might be heightened risk for us relative to our exposure that we may be seeing as our independent <coughs> advisor to the investment committee, where you think those heightened risks may be in the context of what we're trying to achieve. And at the same time, if there are better actors in the industry who are also generating returns, mm -hmm. I think it's important that you highlight that to our staff, and I'm sure you do, and to this investment committee, because I think the industry will continue to be under scrutiny. Um, we will continue to, and we've made an asset allocation decision to allocate a 15 percent of the portfolio into private equity. We want to do it in a responsible way, one in which we're uh, upholding our values, sharing those with our partners, and being not only generating the returns that are necessary, but being a force for good 
where it can be possible. I know there are skeptics and doubters, uh, but they don't sit in these seats uh, relative to our responsibility to pay the promise to the teachers. We, we need to be skeptical. We need to uh, trust but verify with our staff, but at the same time, we also have to have the benefits to make promise to the teachers. And I think you're spot on. I think the industry will continue to be under scrutiny. And I'm pleased to hear what Chris, our CIO, has said, what he's looking to do post-retirement. And I know our staff knows what this value, the board stands for. So as our independent, independent uh, private equity consultant to this committee, I would encourage you to bring to our attention and bring to light Uh, Great. Understood. Thank you. Um, uh, is there any public comment? We do have one public comment for item 3C. If we could get a three minute timer, please. Our speaker will be Don. NEA regarding this. The questionnaire that is given out to the public equity partners uh, is that questionnaire, the questions on it specifically, is that publicly available? Can we see a copy of that? And then the other half, and I, th I think the chair partially answered this, are the uh, completed questionnaires available for the uh, CalSTRS board to review in closed session? Thank you. Well, I, th I think that answer has to come from um, general counsel. The answer is no, those are not publicly available documents because they relate to your investment strategy, which is protected. Um, and so, no, there, there may be um, compendiums. You may be able to provide some summary information, but those documents and the answers are not available to the public. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other further public comment? Seeing none, uh, I would suggest, uh, since, you know, we, we this went on a, a bit longer, and, and, and rightly so, it was a a very fulsome discussion, and I appreciate it. Uh, can we take maybe a 10-minute break and get back here uh, at uh, 5 of noon and try to move the agenda on? Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. For, thank you, thank you. They've given me this now. How's that? Huh? Wow. <laughs> uh, we're at uh, item number four, which is Collaborative Strategies Portfolio Investment Policy. This is a first reading. Uh, who is among this absolutely <laughs> sterling group? is going to make the presentation. I'm going to kick it off, Bill. Oh, the gold, the gold, the gold part of the group. Okay. And I am uh, afraid with the, that you have the power of the gavel. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, people are thanking afraid, me now. Be very afraid. Be very afraid. Why don't we kick this off? Let's move to the next slide, please. If you recall, way back in the May 2022 Investment Committee meeting, we presented the concept of an opportunities portfolio. And the rationale was fairly straightforward, fairly simple. Asset classes were finding opportunities that we felt were great for our total fund, but maybe not a great fit for their asset class for a variety of reasons. You know, perhaps the risk return fell in between asset classes, or it was combining, the investment was combining two asset classes together. So by designing the opportunities portfolio sleeve in the collaborative strategies portfolio, we thought we would create a competitive advantage for CalSTRS to invest in these types of opportunities while our peers could not. For, and there, <clears throat> you know, besides these types of opportunities, every day, as you know, the markets are volatile, they're shifting, and every year we see a whole new set of opportunities that if we had a flexible structure, we could react nimbly to them, we, we could capture them. And so, for example, today, as many of you might know, due to Basel III, which is a framework, a regulatory framework that, is, that essentially... Uh, sets the capital requirements for banks. And those banks, because of that, these banks are quickly divesting of all kinds of assets. And what we're going to see in, in practice is a doubling or tri tripling of these private credit type of opportunities, particularly on the real asset side of the business, you know, just as a quick example. 
Finally, I, I would just want to make note that we also want to take advantage of our scale because with scale, we can better execute the cloud model and that leads to lower costs. So if we think about the sizing of our positions, if we size our positions for each of the asset classes, that necessarily would be fairly small. But if we think about the risk and diversification of the total fund, we certainly have the capacity to increase uh, the sizing of our positions. And if we execute it right, if we execute it well, we could really add to the risk return of the, of the total portfolio. So with that being said, I'm gonna hand it off to the team and I think Mike. Okay, first we'll do a couple quick introductions. I'm Mike Duray. Uh, the director of senior, <laughs> I didn't do that one. The senior director, the senior moment, the senior director of private markets. Glenn Blasse, uh, currently a portfolio manager of the Innovative Strategies um, uh, portfolio with an investment strategy and risk. Hi, Kirsty Jenkinson, the director of sustainable investment and stewardship strategies. We can go to the next slide. Um, back one, please. Okay, so. Uh, essentially, what we're doing is we are moving from the innovation portfolio and putting together a collaborative strategy portfolio and policy. And uh, essentially, the main ask we're asking is to uh, add an opportunity sleeve, which uh, we'll talk about in a bit, um, and also increase the range of the portfolio from 0 to 2.5% to 0 to 5%, because now we have two innovation plans going and the opportunities portfolio would be housed in this portfolio. And we're also asking to increase the single investment limit from 0.5% of the total fund to 1% uh, of the total fund. And that goes to Scott's comment that if we have the opportunity to invest at scale, that would give us uh, an excellent opportunity to do so within this program. Um, let's go to the next next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to turn over to Glenn, who uh, actually has spent 15 years running the Innovative Strategies portfolio for Calsters, and in the uh, board item, you can see some of the accomplishments of that group, which Glenn has been there for the entire time. Um, and he's going to briefly explain how this is going to work um, in this portfolio. Great. Good morning, and um, yeah. So what I'd like to show you here is, I, I love visuals, so visuals help me a lot. Um, on the left, you have Innovative Strategies, the current Innovative Strategies um, portfolio that, that I currently oversee, which is mainly diversifying private credit currently, but it is still, um, has a role for incubation, you know, if, if other strategies, you know, prove to be interesting. Within that Innovative Strategies policy, we currently have also the, the CIS-directed private asset portfolio operating under that same policy. So that's, that's not changing. This is, the, this is today the current, current view, is innovative strategies and CIS-directed private asset portfolio operating under innovative strategies policy. So what we're asking today is to take this to a new level and call it the collaborative strategies portfolio, so renaming it, and then the innovative strategies and CIS-directed private asset portfolio um, will be in a new sleeve called the innovation sleeve. And so then we'll be adding a second sleeve called the opportunities sleeve. So this is the, really the new part of this. Um, so, so currently the innovative strategies, which would include the CIS directed private asset portfolio is roughly, let's call it one and a half percent of the total plan. And our current limit is zero to two and a half percent. So, you know, we haven't reached that two and a half percent but looking at pacing over the next year and a half, we could start to bump up against that. Uh, but we still have some dry powder there. But what this new allocation to zero to 5% does is it increases opportunities in what we're calling the opportunity sleeve, which will really be assets that are brought by the asset classes. So these deals would be brought to the collaborative strategies portfolio by the asset class sponsors. Um, so it allows both public and private asset classes to bring deals to this collaborative strategies portfolio um, that might otherwise not, not fit in, in, in their world. So I just think it expands our opportunities and creates more flexibility and to Scott's point and increases the ability for us to be um, the partner of choice and to lean in, in some, you know, more scale than a typical incubation portfolio would be able to provide. Um, 
And uh, yeah, Kirstie's up here because uh, if any questions come up about uh, her particular portfolio, but we're opening it to questions right now. Are you, are you finished? Mm -hmm. Okay, Sharon. So, I <laughs> So are you saying, Glenn, that basically maybe to add to your visual that there should be another green circle connecting innovative and cis-directed? So those are kind of... So in, in just, the item, we have a circle around innovative strategies and cis-directed private assets. That is the innovation sleeve. Okay. Um, so I, I think it was, it was better illustrated, I think, in our, in our agenda item. But on the slide, yeah, I would circle okay. of those would be the one sleeve. Got it. Okay, right. I just wanted to make sure I was understanding. And there's what no we're set allocation between these sleeves. So the zero to five percent is at the highest level of the collaborative strategies board. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Karen. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I like the visuals too. Um, what I wanted to know is this is probably an obvious question, but if if the if the innovative strategies, the innovative sleeves is private. Will the opportunity sleeve also have to be private, or could they be both pri private and public? No, um, good question, Karen. Um, they can be both public and private. So we're opening this up to any asset class that has a deal that they would like to, to bring to, to our internal committee. So it would be both public or private. Okay, right. thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Um, thank you. Uh, Makita? has reviewed this and uh, could you give us your, uh, the results of your review and comments? Sure, uh, Steve McCourt with Makita Investment Group. Uh, we uh, worked with staff on this policy, uh, provided significant feedback and the, the, the policy recommendation uh, that's in front of you from, from staff reflects uh, Makita's feedback during the process. We've also provided uh, a memorandum uh, in your material that supports uh, the policy change. I just want to highlight a couple of uh, items related to this. Uh, most importantly, uh, the investment committee has been made uh, aware of the, the strategy around the opportunity sleeve and uh, the evolving uh, use of innovative strategies in CIS for um, several years and most importantly during the asset allocation process. Uh, so, so for us anyway, this isn't uh, new information. Uh, staff, we think, has done a really nice job of uh, creating a policy around these opportunities uh, that uh, both is effective, but as importantly as your portfolio gets more complex, is simple. Uh, and increasingly, we we favor simple with uh, with policies. Uh, I also want to note that. Uh, uh, as it relates to the collaborative strategies portfolio, uh, from a from an asset allocation perspective, this ha this asset class has a target allocation of zero percent, um, which by definition means that uh, any capital that's allocated uh, into these categories that fall beneath the collaborative strategies portfolio uh, is capital that is underweight policy targets and other asset classes, and so what that means is staff is making a, a, a a tactical decision to invest capital here as opposed to um, to other asset classes. And, and that'll be reflected in our our reports. Uh, I'm sure the CIO reports to you <coughs> as well. And as, as you know, from our perspective, uh, that is a, a, a more satisfactory way of governing uh, these types of uh, investments. Uh, so overall, we're supportive um, of this. Happy to, to take any questions that, that the community might have for Makita. Sharon. Um, if there are other questions from, from committee members, but I would, I, I know that we could do a second reading, but if there aren't any um, significant um, other questions, I would move that we approve the policy change. You want to uh, make a motion to approve the staff recommendation, <coughs> Scott? One thing, uh, Sharon, that uh, we discussed uh, last night with uh, Investment Committee Chair uh, Bill and and the Vice Chair Gale was that uh, we would like to the opportunity to, to take the policy back and make a few modifications, okay. Great. and then bring it back. We'll explain those modifications. 
Yeah. Uh, Karen? Hi, thanks. Thanks again. Yeah. Um, can you just explain what decommission really involves? I mean, what happens, there was staff before, so what? how does that work out in terms of decommissioning the innovative strategies policy? How does, as far as people goes, uh -oh. what happens? What happens? <laughs> <laughs> they take they take your bars away. <laughs> uh, it's a fancy word for saying we're substituting this policy for the old policy, and we're we're absorbing everything that was in the innovation policy into this program and policy. So the people that worked in that are going to be kind of um, divided or, or spread out in this new policy. They, uh, or? Uh, for instance, nothing changes with CIS because they're their own group. Right. Um, and with respect to the innovation strategies portfolio, there is private credit. That stays intact as well. And so does some of the team that has been doing some of the innovation in the past. However, it's important to point out when the board gave additional allocation for private debt uh, to fixed income, uh, specifically direct lending the low, with the low, on the lower risk scale, some of the people that were doing that in the Innovative Strategies team moved over to fixed income to assist them in, in building out that portfolio. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, if there are no further questions, uh, we look forward to seeing the uh, minorly revised uh, <laughs> policy, just, uh, just to have a little bit consistency. Just to explain what happened, I think, is that a lot of these policies over the years, um, when they've gone back to redraft this particular policy, there was a, a, a incongruent s system used. And so they're just going to clean it up and bring it back and explain. So anyway, thank you very much. Uh, item number, oh, public comment, excuse me. There are no members of the public in the queue. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, item number five, fis fixed income investment policy. First reading. Hello, good afternoon. Um, Glenn Hosakala, the director, your director of fixed income. I'm here with Kathy DeSalvo, portfolio manager of our external managers, as well as the private credit sleeve for us. Um, we're here for the first reading of the uh, fixed income policy. And um, with that, I'll be brief and I'll just hand it over to Kathy. Hi, everyone. Um, as Glenn mentioned, um, we are here today to recommend an update to the fixed income policy following the 2023 ALM study in which the investment committee approved a 2% increase to the fixed income allocation um, to add private credit. Um, we've added language, we're adding language to the policy to incorporate, incorporate private credit to the opportunistic sleeve of fixed income. Makita has reviewed and concurs with the proposed changes um, to the policy and we are happy to take questions. Um, Scott, did you have a comment? No, I, I think Kathy covered it. It's pretty pretty administrative. Yeah, I believe this. this uh, although the, the, just a, the last page of uh, page six of attachment number three to item five, um, this is uh, the following reports uh, will be uh, prepared and presented to the board uh, unless otherwise stated. Um, those those are traditionally been reported to the board. Is that correct? Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, fine. Uh, any questions on this item? Hearing none, um, I would take a motion. Uh, Gail Miller, that makes the motion. Is there a second? Second? Okay. Um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, we don't need a roll call, do we? It's just for information. Okay, thank you. It's an acceptance of a policy. Yeah. Oh, to, oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Because of let me to, because of the change in Bagley Keen allowing for this sort of hybrid meeting of participation remotely, all of our um, votes are now going to be roll call votes. Okay, gotcha. Um, I just Fine. To, 
to let you know that. And also, well, thanks um, for letting me know. Thank you. I, I apologize for that. And also, I was making a note, and I just wondering, did we have public comment on this last item? We oh. have no members of the public in the queue. I guess not. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you, Brian. I appreciate it. Uh, okay, would you take the roll, please? Absolutely, Ms. Scott. Gallos. Aye. Ms. Sanders. Aye. Uh, Mr. Prezant. Aye. Ms. Yamamoto. Aye. Mr. Tang. Aye. Ms. Bradford. Yes. Mr. Keeley. Aye. Mr. Gunning. Aye. Mr. Henning. Aye. Ms. Miller. Aye. Chairperson Prezant, the motion passes. Thank you. Um, well, that brings us to our lunch break, and I appreciate uh, the speed with which we got here. Uh, we will um, be back here. Let's see, it's 12.15. Um, how about 1.15? Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Seventeen. Ah, we're almost on time. Um, welcome back. Hope everybody had a nice lunch break. Uh, we are now on item number six, which is the investment policy statement liquidity language. And Geraldine, are you the presenter for this? Yes, I am. Welcome. All right. So uh, Geraldine Jimenez, senior. Investment Director, Public Assets. This item is recommending a change to your investment policy statement. And it has a long history. So May of 2023, you approved the asset allocation, which did move to less liquid asset portfolio. In July, you approved the actual policy. And in the policy, you updated your number, saying that no more than 55% would be in, in illiquid assets. Well, since then, in September and then November, we talked to you a lot about how we manage liquidity and how we've been doing it successfully over time and that we're comfortable with the illiquid status of the portfolio and that we can respond to rebalancing opportunities, avoid for selling. Uh, and then in January, we talked to you about a tool, Leverage, and you approved a policy to let us use Leverage to manage our cash flows. So today really is a follow-on, just updating the policy to be in alignment with that those conversations over the time. We did survey peers, and they do have more of a principle base, which is what we're going recommending you go to rather than a number in policy. And then we also show you an attachment, how we'll give you enhanced reporting on the solvency, which basically we almost have three times the assets. You look at a chart that we can pay any liabilities, uh, any cash flows within a 90-day period. So um, Makita has their opinion memo there, and I can answer any questions, or I'm sure Makita could too. Any questions of Geraldine? Uh, Steve and Stephanie, any comments on this? Uh, S Steve McCourt, uh, Makita, we have a memorandum in the material for uh, your consideration. Uh, just only comment is that we uh, reviewed staff's proposed changes, uh, discussed them with staff, and concur that uh, removing the 55% the limit uh, on illiquid assets uh, is both consistent with uh, best practice in the industry and consistent with staff's uh, ongoing efforts to address liquidity in a more wholesome fashion for you. Very good. Any questions? Uh, this is a, a first reading. If you believe that it is consistent with uh, a consensus point of view of the board, uh, I would be able to take a motion. No, no. Uh, oh, public comment. Again, I forget. I'm so sorry. Public comment. Any public comment? Okay. Gail? I think this, again, is when, when we kind of think about all of the various policies that we're taking to create the most nimble kind of partner of choice policy, I, I, I do think that the work you've done is extraordinary. So with that, happy to make a motion on this. It, it really sets us up in a way that the, the thoughtfulness going forward allows us to weather some, 
some complicated situations. So with that, and, I will move approval. And Ken has seconded it, um, and will because of the uh, current uh, ability to attend by video um, or Zoom, uh, we'll have a roll call vote. Ms. Canadios? Aye. Ms. Sanders? Aye. Ms. Yamamoto? Aye. Mr. Tang? Aye. Ms. Bradford? Yes. Ms. Hendricks? Aye. Mr. Gunning? Aye. Mr. Henning? Aye. Ms. Miller? Aye. Chairperson Prezant, would you care to vote? Uh, aye. The motion passes. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Geraldine. And again, thank you, Makita, for your good work. Uh, the next item is uh, our CIO report uh, from Christopher Ailman. I think I remember him. <laughs> we know him. Thank you much. Um, yep. <laughs> Let's see. I guess this is two. One left. Um, Makita hit on it already, but I'm going to bring it up in slides, which is, as he said, the market really turned around and rebounded. You can see, look at the no, low number in October, and, and I'll have a couple of slides on interest rates. It was the famous Fed pivot where, you know, in October, right before Halloween, he's talking about um, raising rates, fighting inflation. Then all of a sudden in November, it's the first time he said, we can pause. And the markets just went nuts. Um, and it is led by the Magnificent Seven, which is really, frankly, now the Magnificent Four. It's getting narrowing. We have hit, uh, in, in for Pat Geyer and others, uh, starting in March, we started hitting $330 billion in assets. So that's an all-time record high for us. Uh, I think it was just about four or five days ago that we hit it. Um, uh, right before, actually, you're right, right before the March uh, benefit payment went out. Um, but that's the all-time record high for the fund, and that really shows the strength of the market. I made the comment to Bill and Gail in a briefing call that, that the market had hit eight new highs this year. Um, June corrected me, we've hit 15 new highs this year. That sounds out, out just in, not in the portfolio, but in the U.S. equity market, that sounds outrageous, but that's just because little incremental bumps up every time. And then you have big days where, you know, it'll go up 500 or like yesterday, it'll drop 500. Uh, but yeah, the numbers are pretty big and it's because of those four stocks. Uh, they just reported earnings, earnings were strong. And so things are going well. So really surprising, but the equity market is strong. US equity market is doing okay as well. Even though we hear lots of comments about Europe, it is still performing all right as well, even though it doesn't have you know, the AI stocks and the Magnificent Seven in it. Here's the asset allocation, all, and as I've told you before, very close to our target allocation. We are taking the least amount of risk away from our, your target that we have almost than I can remember in the past 15 plus years. Um, and it's because of the uncertainty. Uh, we're hitting record highs, that's great. I mean, you normally would say, well, why aren't you, you know, at the top of the range in public equity? We are frankly, when the market hits new highs, we take profits and we use it to rebalance. We know we have lots of private equity, as was discussed earlier, so we're a little bit overweight growth, but we're just not comfortable being fully bullish and, and overweight growth because there's just so much uncertainty, which I'll get into. So here's the pivot. It may not look like much on the chart, but to us, it, it was massive. I, it's literally, I remember where I was and where I was sitting when I realized the, the news from, from Jay Powell. But I tried to color code these and it sort of didn't come out. The top one's supposed to be uh, orange for Halloween. Um, and that's where we were basically at Halloween. The brown one for Thanksgiving, it's turkey. Um, yeah, communications takes out my little icons. It wouldn't be appropriate for a professional slideshow. Um, but anyway, the brown gravy turkey uh, is how quickly it already moved by Thanksgiving. But then the pink line is is my version of how, uh, Valentine's Day. But, you know, so the short end has not changed at all. Uh, interest on your money market funds has not changed. Short-term CDs have not changed. And you can see it really starts at a year. That's where the curve dropped. 
and and literally from close to five percent all the way down to four a hundred basis points uh, for a drop in the long end of the market. Mortgage rates came down. A lot of things really moved. Now the market's bouncing back up and down. If I brought that up to March, we'd be at about 440 in the long end. But you can also see, yes, the curve is slightly negative inverted from the really short end, but from basically two years out, it's flat. So remember that we've had an inverted and negatively sloped yield curve for <clears throat> two and a half years. We've now really kind of hit the flat range and where we may eventually kind of go in uh, uh, positively slope, maybe. Uh, but that really was a significant change. And that's what you saw in bonds and you saw out of equities. And that really right now will dominate our fiscal year within the, the fund. This is a, sh a shot of the annual inflation rate. While they say their target is two, close enough for government workers, they're happy with three or 2.8. I think from everybody that I'm talking to that really is an expert on this, uh, that inflation is going to be sticky in the threes, and we may have some some blip ups to three and a half and four. Quick snapshot for you. Sounds unrelated, but it's very related. The Panama Canal has about 36 ships. It can pass through either direction. Um, so figure 18 ships each way in a day. Because of the lack of water in that lake that they use to fill the canal, they're down to 24. So a a one third cut in ship passage. That means those, you know, it, it sounds, doesn't sound like a big number, but those 12 ships have now got to go around the Horn of South Africa. Um, but that's massive. And their wet season is not going to start until uh, May and June. Um, so they have to keep limiting traffic. We still have the problems in the Strait of Hormuz. So there are just natural things that are occurring due to climate change that may make inflation sticky, I think, for the next five to 10 years. I don't think we're gonna go back to what you, we saw in the mid, mid 20 teens of below 2% inflation. Here's the equity markets. You can see that run up from November. It literally is a pivot point. Um, and this is the Russell 3000. So it shows you how dominant those handful of stocks are. They are moving an index that has 2,996 other names in it. Uh, but they're really, it really is driving higher. Um, a chart I want to show and highlight again in May before I leave is coming up into the future. You know, a lot of people are trying to speculate today on what's the economic impact of either candidate running and being elected president. And, and I think while there will be certainly key differences, the overriding background that they can't change is that the budget deficit will grow substantially and the interest rates that the U.S. government has to pay on the debt we've borrowed is gonna to grow to over 3% of GDP. I told you last time, it's more than we spend on the defense budget, which you know is a gigantic budget. This doesn't even include normal entitlements and social security and all those other challenges we're gonna have. But this is just interest on the deficit. Bill. Yeah, I don't mean to interrupt, but, but I'm very sure. curious. Um, how much of that is debt that is being refinanced that was borrowed on short-term, or it was, yeah, borrowed on short-term bases during the time we had low interest rates. Yeah, it's been interesting. I was critical for a while that the Fed did not, the Treasury Department, sorry, did not extend the maturities. And in essence, like you're saying, when rates are near zero, why didn't they borrow 30-year, issue 30-year debt? Borrow long like we did. Their own formula, they're convinced that there is an insatiable appetite for T-bills. You know, when you think about T-bills, it's a three-month, six-month, nine-month note, one-year note, sorry. Everybody wants them globally. Central banks use them. Money markets use them. Uh, they are such a widespread global instrument. And even though they're AA rated, there's only one AAA left. They're all AA from the rest of the agencies. They just by nature put a lot of that debt in the short end. And so unfortunately, they didn't extend it. So I, I don't know the ratio, Bill, but I'm going to say it's almost two thirds of the deficit is financed in short term rates. Mm -hmm. So when rates went from zero to suddenly five, that's why this graph jumps. Look at the 2020 number. 
when rates are near zero to suddenly 2023, it's not because the deficit grew, it's because of the interest on the debt they have to pay. And I can tell you, having been spent time uh, in, outside the U.S., non-U.S. investors, when they look at the world, the USA is half of the global stock market. So if they're global like we are, they're going to have half their money here. This is the chart they're aware of, and they wonder how the U.S. is going to deal with it. You know, Because to them, they look at the U.S. and say, hey, you're a debtor nation. You're lucky people bar buy your, your borrowing and will keep loaning you money. Um, I'll write to you more often, but I think watching these auctions on the 10, uh, 20, and 30-year bond especially is going to really be important. How, how well those auctions go into the future. Do people keep buying our long-dated debt? We know they want to buy our short-dated debt, but that's going to get expensive going forward. And, and whoever is in charge is really going to, is just basically not going to be able to balance a budget and certainly not create a surplus. They're going to be overwhelmed. Imagine just having the best example I can give you. Think about a credit card. Probably all of us, at least I did, came out of college with credit card debt, and you paid the minimum. And suddenly the interest on what you owed was bigger than what you were putting on the card, and it's that debt snowball. I really feel like the USA has a debt snowball, and it's not. I, obviously in the next four years it's not going to get controlled. All right, so economic picture is still mixed. Uh, it's really, to us, a balancing act. Uh, you know, rates are still up 500 basis points. The Fed hasn't eased yet, and Jay Powell said today he's not going to until he's convinced he's going to be slow in easing. So, you know, when they do ease, it's only going to be 25 basis points, which is right now it's, you know, five and a quarter to 550. It'll drop to five. Um, inflation is off. Corporate earnings are still really solid. You know, we always go to June and, and the trade desk to wonder how are the earnings reports. Everyone beats the earnings estimate. That's just a game people play with the, with the analysts. But it really is becoming important. And inflation is going to be sticky. And you're going to see the market have just heart palpitations every time inflation jumps to three and, you know, three and say three quarters or four. Um, but... I think we're just going to see it in the, the twos to threes and fluctuate in that range. Risks on the horizon have not really changed. Um, uh, you know, China's economy is dramatically slowing. It is almost, it's weighting in the index is almost half of where it was because China, rest of the, vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world has slowed that dramatically. You do have two major wars and the, and the ensuing conflict. Obviously, election tension is just starting today. And remember the warning from Ian Bremmer about AI and deep fakes. You know, that robocall that apparently happened a couple of months ago where Joe Biden's voice was telling people what to do. That was done by somebody in Texas. It was not done by Iran or China or people who, re you know, Russia, who really want to mess with our country. And you know they will do everything they can. Uh, you know, our enemies are going to come at us when we're vulnerable in this election cycle. So uh, long-term risks, you know, if I could put U.S. election, you've all heard the story that over half of the world, I think, population is voting. Some elections are not really real, uh, but the rest of them are really material, and we're going to hear about it. Um, uh, I still put Ian Bremmer's list up there of, of digital viruses as well as biological viruses are a risk. Um, I took off the near-Earth objects because I didn't want to get Michael's wrath again. Uh, but hey, they're, they're still up there and they could fall. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I had to watch gravity again on the plane. So Russia could hit a satellite and then it's, you know, cataclysmal events anyway. Uh, but you know, Iran is still out there. North Korea is obviously a huge problem. Uh, the Israel Hamas war is such a tragedy. Uh, and the Russia Ukraine war, I can't believe we're at two years and still a horrendous tragedy. So um, this is going to be a difficult world going forward. Yet, with all this and the risks I showed you, you know, all these markets hitting all new highs. So I have a hard time explaining that to you, but it is. That's facts. Questions? Any questions? 
Uh, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, uh, Chris, you mentioned a lot about kind of um, Ian Bremer, and I, I do think just if the board hasn't had a chance to read his emails, we we can do that. But I, I think it's worth just when when you send your note talking about some of the geopolitical risks and tensions he's talking about, just because they're so multifaceted, obviously the wars and AI. But then I, I just think um, he talks about the future of work and the these belief systems around transition the energy supply that we've spoken a lot about, whether or not we even have enough capacity to, to you know, provide the energy we need for the future. So it might be worthwhile just to even forward the link to what he's saying, because I do think it's super informative and, and that way uh, folks here have that background, but but all really, really well taken and I think really important just yeah, that we are. I'll check our subscription to see if I can forward it. Oh, yes. Uh, I heard that from my legal counsel. Uh, Ian Bremer, you'll know when you're reading his stuff because he doesn't capitalize. And I tr usually, if I'm sending it to you, parts of it, I will try to make the point of capitalizing because otherwise it, I can even tell you personally, it just really gives you a headache. Uh, you're wondering why us is always there instead of the U.S. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Well, again, uh, Chris, uh, thank you for uh, this report, all the preceding reports, and uh, we're looking forward to the next report. Uh, get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we go to the consent agenda, item number eight. Ah, is there public comment on the chief investment officer's report? There are no members of the public in the queue. <laughs> feel good about myself now. <laughs> um, a consent agenda uh, action, uh, a consent agenda uh, credit enhancement program policy. We're just doing away with the, an, an acronym. Uh, so I assume that unless there's objection, uh, there's consent. Any, any item on this, uh, the, the contract extension for Makita, uh, approval of the minutes of January 11th, 2024, and September 13th, 2023. Uh, everything okay there? Uh, no objection. Thank you. We, of course, I'm sitting next to the person who would really kick me if there was. Um, it's fixed. <laughs> it's fixed. <laughs> okay. Um, committee, let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay, information item. Uh, Let's see, we review our information items. I did not note any RFIs. Did we want to um, take a, a roll call vote on the consent agenda? Consent. Oh, okay, roll call vote on the consent guy. Yeah, excuse me on that one. It's okay. Ms. Gallegos? Aye. Ms. Sanders? Aye. Ms. Yamamoto? Aye. Mr. Tang? Aye. Ms. Bradford? Aye. Ms. Hendricks? Yes. Mr. Gunning? Aye. Mr. Henning? Aye. Ms. Miller? Aye. Chairperson Prezant, would you care to vote? Yes. Motion's passed. Thank you. Okay. Draft agenda of the next meeting. Any? Chris? I just want to highlight the focus of that meeting is really going to be, besides my last, uh, it will be a focus on uh, DE&I, wrapping up that big work plan project for this year for us, uh, and the wrap-up will not be finishing it. It will be launching a new business plan focus uh, for our DE&I efforts. And then, of course, May is always our big focus on net zero and where we are on that path and what we're doing. So those are the key items. I can already tell you will be the key part of the big three. So, And I neglected to report one other thing, Bill, if I may have a moment. Um, uh, the real estate industry uh, has uh, several major publications, but I am pleased to say that uh, PRIA, also the Real Estate Industry Association, uh, gave a Lifetime Achievement Award to Mr. Mike DeRay, uh, and well deserved. So. And uh, yeah, we'll be telling him to retire soon too. No. <laughs> we promoted him. Because he's so good. So anyway, thank you. Well, thank you. And Mike, uh, from all of us, I, we're so proud of you and, and proud that you spent the time here and made the contributions you've made. It's, uh, it's really uh, amazing. And uh, the next time we see you, we hope you wear your 
ice cream suit. <laughs> oh, good, good. Uh, all right, let's see. Uh, draft agenda, we've gone through. Uh, well, that finishes uh, any public comment on any of this. There are no members of the public in the queue. Uh, well, that finishes the uh, public meeting. Uh, we now go into closed session. Um, which uh, we probably should do it here, uh, I think. And so for those who are uh, not uh, presenting, uh, I, I would uh, suggest that you excuse yourselves. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully 345 appeals. Members of the public appeals at 345. Back here. <laughs>